Welcome back. So today, not a good day. Don't love to see it, but overall, market, baby. I mean, if you look at a lot of the big things, you could even look at your SPY. Look at that. So things could definitely get worse. Tesla here, MasterCard as well, down uh, 5% on the day. Lucid, who's been having a good run, lost his momentum. Profit takers, Apple as well. So just showing y'all some other stocks, not just Metamaterials. Palantir, uh, great long-term stock in my opinion. So Metamaterials, it's not an overall meta problem. Definitely have been losing interest and momentum kind of here uh, with financials coming out as expected and things like that. But the overall potential and long-term hold of meta materials hasn't changed uh, so i'll be holding on and scooping up any dips as is if we continue on this downtrend watch for some key levels or to watch for some key levels we could always catch up about every five to ten cents because i think we're well oversold here under four dollars as is and then as well as if the market uh kind of turns around i think we will get to working uh back up towards these fours and so on and so forth so some levels if this does continue we touched 385 uh, a couple times here today if we got under that watch for about 380 and as i said catch up about every five to ten cents so maybe 375 370 a bigger key level that i'm watching for if we get under about this range here also could start trading more sideways just underneath these fours here being oversold uh currently but we'll just have to see uh about 366 is that next Fibonacci retracement line that we drew up a while back. So maybe look for a bounce uh, coming off of this area here. If we continued on, I'm not expecting all these tomorrow, by the way. This would maybe be more so if it continued for weeks on end. We'll also be looking at some highly speculative stuff uh, that is going to be possibly pointing to next monday never put dates on anything no guarantees here just looking at the possibilities and what might shake out uh of next monday in the after hours maybe we get some cool little goodies we would just have to see uh but if we did get under this 366 i'm expecting if we got if we fell underneath this range and, and weren't trading sideways here wouldn't be surprised if we were trading sideways uh in this area but if we got under 366 350 and then 338 is kind of the last place that we consolidated uh before we made continued on a run to 650 i don't expect just to retrace all the way back down to your 288s we know that's where we officially kind of took off from uh always could if it stayed bad throughout uh the end of the year but we got the the shareholders meeting that should give us some momentum we should get an update on dividend or spinoff at that date always could get delayed till the end of the year but we're getting close enough to the end of the year at that point uh looking for some sort of guidance at the meeting could give us no guidance but we'll just have to see uh we know things are currently in the works getting in compliance we'll see if they get it sold before the end of the year and all that good stuff so I uh, just wanted to give you all some key levels. We could shake this all, all off tomorrow uh, and be working right back up to your fours. I don't think these will be very heavy resist, as I kind of said, uh, I believe already. Uh, but look for this 428 to kind of be confirmation that rally is uh uptrend is firm locked in ready to lock <laughs> rock and roll so we'll just have to see i'm not too worried in your daily daily price action especially when i see other stocks really just getting hammered and overall small caps really got hammered so today we're going to be looking at the speculative stuff uh Georgia's stock twitch timeline a little bit on twitter's not too much he gave us a nice little sneak peek uh yesterday so to some uh products that we have or some production capabilities that we have uh and then as well as uh at the end of this we're going to be uh, there's going to be an awe event. It's Andrew Mark and Rajiv Paula. Uh, they're two guys who kind of work more so in the lab and it's more te technical and more scientific and things like that. So uh, it came accessible to me on the 15th when, uh, since I bought a ticket to the awe event. I know not everyone has access to it. So not don't definitely don't have to watch it. It's just a presentation, but it is different than the presentation that Jordan Chef shows us. So I think everyone can kind of learn something new. And I was like listening to... Uh, different people on the team can kind of get different perspectives on the way uh meta materials works and things like that so i think it's very interesting but of course uh don't have to tune in that's why this one's kind of long but uh if we continue on here this is george's twitter giving us a nice sneak peek of roll to roll nano imprinting lithography pretty exciting stuff i think we're just close 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 to getting lifted off of base camp so we'll just have to see uh this is once again talking about ar fusion technologies uh meta hats there he should definitely sell those i'm sure he would sell plenty of them so uh also go check out the website plenty of updates and things like that always tightening up looking making it look more fancy this is talking about open sourcing tesla patents and how anyone can kind of use them but once you actually put pen to paper uh tesla can kind of use licensing and things like that to kind of get their fees patents in the right hands can offer unlimited leverage so we know we got plenty of patents uh we'll have to be uh looking forward to the future of course to when we get lifted off the ground but i think all in good time meta materials is going to be uh helping uh, other people produce 
more innovative products. So uh, we're going to be a part of lots of things. It's just taking some time to get lifted off the ground, but not here to convince anybody. You got to do what you got to do, but y'all know what I'll be doing. The speculative part here, this comes from me from Chad. Uh, we'll look up his at name right here real quick. Uh, Chief ER ch is his twitter so he was talking about, about uh when this blinding light song was released and it uh that george tweeted out this morning it was released november 29 2019 on the album called the after hours it's a stretch i know highly speculative uh <laughs> chad said he doesn't doesn't really love uh going deep down in the rabbit hole but no guarantees on this day we'll just have to see but just some definite possibilities uh of next monday and in the after hours we would just have to see uh but as i said we're not putting all our eggs into this that basket <laughs> we'll just have to see how it all shakes out so this comes from bad underscore char i i believe he might be a little more active on the twitter if, or on stock twitch if i'm not mistaken but it might be a different person this is their speculations coming up for 2022 not going to read through all of them uh but possible your dividend or spin out spin-off update use of meta holographic display in the volkswagen with heads-up displays meta air uh contract with u.s defense or others meta air camera sensors contract license agreement uh glucose wise with the fda this is all just speculation of course no guarantees just kind of some things that they're pointing to might uh possibly happen in 22 major bank senate security we know that that deal is already in progress with the top 10 bank world cup qatar 2022 of course they do have past deal with the suckers and things like that so i think that's very interesting some things to look forward to in 2022 i think the year of 2022 is going to be some good time stuff uh also want to point out if, <laughs> there's going to be plenty of trolls and stuff like that they they were calling me toothless joe and all this good stuff saying some dir dirty things uh be sure to go follow the honey badger he's always bashing down the shorts and things like that and if you if if you like getting into those feuds uh then be sure to go check it out it seems like the trolls are always trying to attack the honey badge and he just don't care but uh yeah we had one come th through they're gonna get really loud on these red days they really gain confidence and stuff like that they've been pretty quiet when we've been rocking and rolling uh here not really rocking and rolling for the past couple months but looking much better in my opinion and then always when these red really super wonky days come out they'll, they'll really start trucking so uh best thing to do in, in my opinion is just give them the nice old mute button and then they're just talking to air uh and they don't get the satisfaction so don't get shook out by the the shields and all those haters and stuff like that just ignore them uh in my opinion meta materials is going to be a great suck and we all know what we're holding so uh as i said not worried about your day-to-day -day price action and as is this is uh overall market walkiness could definitely continue watch for those levels here uh if we kind of fell out of this range and stops trading sideways then definitely probably watch for this 366 380s is decently strong but as far as the fibs and things like that go uh 366 could be a level for reversal so we'll have to see how it all shakes out as i said next will be the awe event uh f from rajiv pala and andrew mark some pretty smart meta dudes very technical very scientific uh but i could listen to people talk about meta materials for day for days especially some really smart people so uh always got to do what you do could get worse in the short term or it could get shaken off here tomorrow or we start trading more sideways we'll have to see how it all shakes out y'all know me i appreciate all y'all oh appreciate all those birthday wishes very very kind of y'all i really do if i didn't type out and say thank you individually i do super appreciate it tried to get to all of them that i did see here today if not i hope i did at least favorite or heart all of them so i uh, appreciate all y'all a whole bunch if you want to stay tuned for this all event coming up uh and i will see you guys sometime tomorrow after that there's a um, if you go to the glass house in san jose i believe there's buses leaving from here there's a, an after party also so a lot of this wouldn't really happen unless we had some sponsors and one of those sponsors uh, happens to be uh, Meta Materials. So big thanks, big shout out to them. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Andrew, who's going to give you a, a review of what these guys are doing. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone. It's, re it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, we've seen a lot of exciting developments, both from big companies and small companies, lots of entrepreneurship. Um, I have to say, suffered a, the dark side of entrepreneurship this morning, so our car was broken into. I think someone saw that as a new business opportunity. So apologies if this is not quite as polished as it should be. Um, so Raghab and I are here to speak to you about um, a variety of technologies that we've developed and, and processes that we're putting in place at Meta uh, to re-serve the augmented reality market. Uh, so a little bit about Meta, the company itself. So we're um, we're a growing company. We, we have a broad patent portfolio uh, that we are continuing to add to. Um, I'll discuss a minute, in a minute 
a variety of different verticals that we're playing within, uh, but we'll focus today on the augmented reality and optical side of things. Um, we have a lot of uh, in-house tools that we've built in the way of simulation software. Um, we do a lot of proprietary design. We do a lot of development work. We're always with the intention of building to volume. Um, one of the things that's really built into the ethos is that we, we want our processes to be scalable because we want to be able to serve a market that's, that's vast and large, um, but we also want them to be sustainable. Uh, we have an environmental, um, we are environmentally aware, let's say, and we're always conscious of and looking for ways to ensure that uh, our technologies and our processes are, are doing the best for the planet. Um, and we're quite proud of the fact that just recently we have uplisted to NASDAQ and we represent the first company that is, has a bend material focus that has been listed publicly on the NASDAQ market. So we do, we do have a global footprint uh, across the world. So uh, we have an office here in Pleasanton, California. That's where Ragup works out of. Um, I myself, I'm based in, in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, on the east side of Canada. Uh, that's the headquarters of the company. We have other locations uh, in London, mainly focused on medical device applications. Uh, and we've recently acquired a company called Nanotech Security, and they have locations uh, for R&D in Burnaby, BC. That's essentially Vancouver. Uh, and then also for manufacturing and production in Thurso, Quebec. And we also have uh, locations for R&D in, in Switzerland, uh, and then sales on offices and distribution centers in, in Denmark and in Japan. So we'd like to divide the various different technologies and product lines that we've got into a couple of different categories. The first is we, we do a lot of work on protection. Uh, so one of the, the first applications that we worked on was laser protection, particularly aimed at the aviation industry. Uh, there's an ongoing problem there with laser attacks on aircraft. Uh, and our technology is designed to protect pilots and protect pilots' vision uh, against those sorts of attacks. Uh, we also do a lot of work on, on nanolithography. Ragup will speak to that in more detail. Uh, and there's a variety of product lines there that are focused on uh, various different ways of connecting, um, both through uh, RF um, and, and other technologies to, uh, to allow um, higher connectivity between various different uh, devices. Um, and then we also have a very strong program for detection. Uh, I, I spoke already about the medical device applications that are being worked on in the London office. Uh, and those are focused mainly on things like non-invasive sensing of glucose, um, and then also things like mammography or, or other um, non-ionizing forms of imaging. But today, what we'll focus on is combiner optics. Um, so we, we, I already mentioned, have a long history of working on laser protection devices uh, using volume holographic ratings. Um, we, we have recently started producing a line of, of optics that are intended for um, lab applications, so optical lab applications, we call these uh, strata and slant. You can see on the left here, uh, would essentially is a conventional uh, or behave something very similar to what a conventional dielectric filter would, would uh, except that it's based on polymer technologies. Uh, and then in the center, you've got something that's a little bit more interesting. You can see a, a white laser beam is striking, or an RGB laser beam, I should say, is, is striking. Uh, the holographic filter, um, and the green beam is being selected and picked off and redirected into an anomalous angle. Um, but what we're, we're most interested in for this particular venue is holographic optical elements. So these are elements that have uh, very highly selective uh, reflection characteristics and, and both reflect and, um, and focus into particular points. Um, so why are they interesting for this application? Because they're useful as combiners. Um, and what do you look for in a holograph or in a combiner for any sort of augmented reality application? Uh, you're looking for something that has high transparency so that you can see the real world, while at the same time being selectively reflective so that you can see the light that's coming from the digital protector. And that allows you to overlay digital information with the real world. Um, and that combiner, whatever technology you use for that, is, is the key element that allows you to, to do that merging of the digital world with the real world. Um, now, to have something that's useful, you have this sort of laundry list on the right-hand side here of different characteristics that are required of that. And a lot of them are contradictory. Um, so you do need to have things like high optical efficiency, but at the same time, you want to have high see-through quality. Um, so there's very much a trade-off analysis that has to be done to ensure that you get the best of both worlds. Um, one of the ones that we, or a couple of the characteristics that we really f are focused on, and, and this is mainly driven by the fact that we're, we're looking to, to enter into partnerships and develop products that are, uh, are, are, will scale to very large volumes. So that means essentially consumer wearables 
all day wearables. And the characteristics that you require for those sorts of applications are, are things like acceptable social or acceptable form factors that are, are, are socially comfortable, um, and things that are lightweight, uh, and, and also a product that has prescription compatibility, and that's something that I'll come back to in a minute. Okay, so our, our main interest here is, is not the projector, it's not the computing, it's, it's the combiner, it's that optical element. And our approach to that is something that we're calling the one-stop shop. Um, so what we offer is for that combiner element, we're offering design expertise, so people can come to us and, and ask essentially what is possible in the way of, uh, of the various different technologies and what are the various trade-offs. Um, the main technology that we use to produce these combiners is, is volume holographic gratings recorded in a photopolymer material. Um, we have a very close relationship with Corvestro, who is the leading supplier of holographic photopolymer material. And what we do, we have an ongoing and, and very fruitful uh, material selection and material development agreement with them. Um, we have the expertise necessary to do the holographic recording itself and to take that hologram and then combine it or assemble it into a stack that can then be integrated into the lens. And one of the most important things that we've got is this, this technology that we call AR Fusion that I'll get into in a little bit more detail that, that allows us to embed the holographic optic element, which is really the functional part, into a lens that can then be embedded into consumer electronics. Uh, and all of this is, is developed using approaches that are scalable to volume manufacturing. Um, so just a couple of words on free space optical combiners. Um, so we're, we're uh, quite fond of these. Um, we think they have a lot of potential because of those social implications uh, and because of the prescription factors that I mentioned earlier. So they offer very high brightness. Um, that means that that translates directly into efficiency. So you're not wasting a lot of light. That means that the, the light source can be dimmer. That means that the battery life can be longer or conversely, the battery can be much smaller. And that contributes to a device that's much more compact and therefore much more um, uh, appealing to consumers. Uh, we, free space combiners also offer high fields of view, uh, very good see-through quality, of course. And, and then this is an important one that I'll come back to in, for a little bit more detail, but they offer not just prescription compatibility, but prescription compatibility in what's called best form. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. Um, and multiple optical functions can be multiplexed into a single piece of film. Okay, that's one really nice thing about volume holographic ratings is that there are limits to this, of course, but you can put multiple functions into one piece of, or one hologram. Um, the other technology that we think is really important is what we're calling AR fusion, and this is the ability to build essentially plastic lenses. Um, but they're plastic lenses into which we can embed the holographic optic element, that key functional uh, component. So what you see on the left-hand side is, is the filling process. So it's, it's a casting process. It's, it happens at, uh, at atmospheric pressure, at low temperatures. Uh, and, and that means that it's suitable for embedding all sorts of relatively sensitive uh, devices. So here, what we're focused on is holographic optical elements. Um, but Ragged will describe in more detail other uh, potential components that can be added to the mix. Um, again, what's important about it is, is that um, these lenses that are produced downstream can be processed using all, all the normal ophthalmic tools that already exist within the industry. There's a huge and very mature industry that, that is out there for, for taking pieces of plastic, essentially, and turning them to eyewear lenses that everyone wears. Um, and so this sort of technology meshes very nicely with that. So uh, one of the things that we're, we'd like to emphasize is that 70% of the population wears glasses. Okay? They need prescription eyewear. Um, and it's, it's one thing to produce a lens that has the right spherical power, as you can see on the right here. So there are different combinations that you can use to produce a given spherical power, but there's, there's one combination known as the best form that is the right one to use, so to speak. So this curve down here, which has been known for 100, 150 years or so, is known as the turning ellipse. And, and this determines for a given prescriptive power what sort of base curve or what sort of curvature you should be using. And the consequences of not doing that is that you get poor peripheral vision. Now, the nice thing about free space combiners for AR is that it allows you to use best form shapes, base curves, to satisfy the prescription that the patient requires. And that's, that's really important for ensuring that you've got, again, the good peripheral vision, but it's also really important for 
we believe acceptance by the medical community. I mean, we're talking about patients and prescriptions here. These are medical devices, class one medical devices. And so, again, one of the big reasons that we think that AR fusion combined with free space optical combiners is so important is that it allows us to produce best form lenses that adhere to all the best principles that have been established by the ophthalmic industry over the last 100 years. Now, we do have an interest and activity in developing waveguides. Uh, so this is an example of uh, using the same approach, cold casting uh, in AR fusion to produce very uh, planar, uh, very smooth, um, and very high optical quality plastic waveguides. Okay, so here are some of the characteristics that you can, you can see are very much comparable to what you would expect for glass. And um, in this case, we have um, some variability and we're working on different indices of refract refraction, um, but the idea is that they're well matched to the Covestro photopolymer material that we know so well. So the idea is that this can be a very uh, a powerful solution, uh, again, by taking advantage of the multiplexing that's possible with volume holographic ratings, Produce, to produce an all polymer solution to the waveguide problem. Um, and that can potentially be very, very lightweight, but also um, splinter free, that's, that's an important safety consideration, and very, very cost effective. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ragip, and he'll guide you through some of the other technologies that we're working on, and, and other things that can be integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. <laughs> Um, in this, I guess uh, there's a little bit of a short amount of time, and this uh, time I, I will try to um, discuss the um, ways we can basically combine electrical and optical functionalities on a small form factor. This is a major challenge for future AR, AR applications, and the challenge is being driven by the wavelength of light, which basically creates a large mismatch between the electrical and optical components. And one way to circumvent that is basically making non-structured materials, which can enable us to combine these uh, features in sub-waving uh, length scales. And we have seen beautiful examples in the past two decades of such structures actually uh, replicating the dielectric optical functionalities in sub-waving uh, ultra-thin film platforms, such as uh, we can make uh, actually um, uh, diffraction, focusing, uh, we can have polarization control as well as light field control. However, until recently, such structures were not be able to be made by using low-cost manufacturing techniques at production scale. And Meta wants to basically aims to fill in this gap with its expertise in the design as well as the manufacturing tools at scale. So up to now, uh, we have discussed our holographic approach where basically we create free space and waveguide combiners using our direct right uh, manufacturing schemes. And in this part, I will describe our manufacturing tools, how to add additional functionalities to the next generation AR components. We have at Meta two distinct lithography approaches. One is UV NIR, uh, or non-impinging lithography, which enables us to make um, grayscale um, printing. So we can basically combine, as you can see in this, I'm uh, sorry, uh, I guess, all right. So it, as you can see in this uh, atomic force microscope image, uh, we can basically combine non-structured materials with micron scale features. This is a unique advantage that allows us to control the color levels as well as the depth. And as a different approach, we have rolling mass lithography, which enables us to print dielectric as well as metallic nanostructures at from 200 uh, nanometers to one micron features. And these two different techniques complement each other. Uh, where basically in, in terms of the material selection as well as the printing scales, we can use it for a variety of applications which enables us to address several applications from brands, secure production to transparent antennas and other electrical functionalities that I will describe in a moment. Just to briefly go over, I, I guess uh, due to the time constant, I will skip on the details of this process. But in the rolling mass lithography, the critical message here is we have basically a combination of phase shift lithography, which is combines the advantages of the soft lithography and roll-to-roll -roll techniques. And in kind of compared to a standard lithography process where you use a standard mask and you are limited to five micron for a roll-to-roll -roll processing, we use a transparent mask which actually uses non-structured features in the mask itself, 
which enables and creates an interference pattern right in the photoresist with sub-wavelength resolution. So using the same materials, low-cost materials and process steps, we can create basically 10 times smaller features in a roll-to-roll -roll fashion. And in the next, um, well, one of the unique, I would say, um, ingredients that we have both for the uh, rolling mass lithography as well as the non imprint lithography is the in-house design capability for optimizing the structures. For every application, we need to tune the parameters by using our analytical models as well as uh, in-house softwares and basically apply these into a master. With a recent acquisition of the Nanotech security, we have now in-house e-beam lithography capability where we make our own masters. And using propriety um, uh, replication process, we can re recombine these masks into a large area mask. And we can basically um, feed this into a 1.2 meter web uh, in the NIL, which can speed up to 150 meters per minute uh, in the printing, which is finally uh, fed into the deposition process. Uh, in the product line, we have color optic, which I just uh, described. We can combine the non-structured features, features with uh, micro-scale features. And this enables us actually to control the motion depth and the color of these features without any use of inks or dye. Here, what you see is actually these colorful pictures, uh, which are created by just tuning the non-structured properties, such as the diameter, the pitch, and the height, we can basically adjust the color, the spectrum of the absorption, and create these colorful uh, pictures. Because of these are non-structured, we can print this really at ultra-high resolution, which is almost impossible to create uh, using a low-cost uh, production. Another feature that we have here is, as I, uh, as I described earlier, using non uh, rolling mass lithography, we can create uh, metallic as well as dielectric non structures. The distinction here from non imprint is that we use a lift off process, meaning we can basically use any type of materials, high dielectrics or metals. Another distinctive property is we do not have any residual layer in between the uh, the features here. So this is complete substrate, which means we can make them completely transparent. Now, by just adjusting the tuning parameters of the, these uh, gradings, we can basically make highly conductive and transparent materials, which we branded as NanoWeb in this case. Here in this chart, I compare the transparency versus sheet resistance for a variety of different uh, competitive technologies. So in addition to the advantages such as being bendable and uh, you know, compatible with the flexible substrates, we can have exceedingly superior conductivity versus transparency. As you can see, it's a single digit at almost 99% transparency. So having such high conductivity enables us to define several different functionalities, electrical as well as optical, that we can basically uh, seamlessly apply onto windows and lensing systems. Thanks to the lithography process, we can basically pattern this non-web or other type of non-structures directly and create features such as this optical functionality of 5G signal, which can be redirected towards signal areas where there is more coverage needed. And similarly, we can make active devices, which have much superior kind of um, Performance. So without sacrificing the transparent antenna properties, we can have highly transparent antennas which can be embedded onto lens systems in order to uh, create high-speed data. So a final uh, application is, I guess, a number of you have the skills now due to COVID having the adjusting the mask and the uh, glasses at the right angle to, uh, to, to prevent the defogging. Uh, we have actually a process which is critical for next AR VR platforms to defog very effectively. And more importantly, we can actually have high conductivity which enables us to make a very high power up to 20 kilowatts per meter square um, rapid heating or applying of bias in order to make fast, ultra-fast electrochromic switching. So with this, uh, I will conclude by uh, our slides. Uh, which basically lists here the future AR fusion components which will be integrated using the tools and the techniques that I have described here. 
I would like to welcome you to our next uh, talk at 2.15, which is presented by our CTO, Jonathan Waldron, who will uh, further elaborate the techniques, uh, how to integrate these function elements into prescription lenses. And I would like to welcome you to our expo um, booth at 2.19 as well. And thank you for all listening. Thank you for that. It's, uh, it's a lot of information in 20 minutes. It's like 10 pounds of sand in a five pound bag. And whoo. But for those of you who have uh, some pe uh, pressing questions, you see there's uh, other avenues today. But we have about three to four minutes. So, oh, please. Let me get down here so you can, uh, everyone can hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure most people recognize the problem you have with uh, the surface relief gratings on um, any kind of waveguide structures having rainbow effects. So standing in a room like this with an overhead light, get a lot of rainbow. Do you get the same problem with your photopolymers? I guess I will let Andrew speak on Take that. that. Um, so volume on graphic gratings, uh, by their nature, by, because, well, by their nature, have much more controlled flare properties. Um, so essentially, you've got a downwards facing parabola for on the Bragg curve, and as a result, you don't get diffraction conditions, or the diffraction condition is much harder to meet. Um, and that, that means that, yeah, as a result, you don't get very much in the way of flare. It does exist, but it's much easier to control. Can you comment on the durability of the lenses for something like safety glasses in an industrial setting? So at the moment, the, the lens technology is not sufficient to pass something like Z87.1. Uh, that's certainly something that we're working on. But at the moment, no, these would not be suitable as uh, replacement lenses for safety wear. Um, so I want to piggyback on the waveguide question. Again, as you know, with SRG waveguides, you have very low uh, brightness, right? You have less than 1% nits in to nits out. Yeah. Can you comment on an example of what your nits in to nits out might be? We, we tend to think in terms of diffraction efficiency for the free space combiners. In principle, we can make a holographic optical element that has 100% diffraction efficiency in all three channels. Now, you tend to not want to do that for aesthetic reasons because it makes the hologram itself much more obvious. But in principle, a free space combiner can be 100% efficient, efficient in those three channels. Now, for a VHG-based in-coupler or out-coupler, there's no real difference in the sense that the, the losses in a, in a waveguide design come, okay, partly from absorbance in the material itself. I think that's controllable and well understood. But really, the efficiency hit that you get with a waveguide design is because you're illuminating the entire eye. All the light is being divided over the entire outcoupler. So eyebox replication, the p price you pay for eyebox replication is efficiency. That's not something that's unique to VHGs or SRGs. So with that, I want to say thanks to our presenters this morning for a fantastic job.